It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. In this episode, taxes. I'm sorry, there's actually good news about taxes. There were a lot of people who failed to file over the last couple of tax years, and there's actually almost like a forgiveness period from the IRS, for real. I'm going to tell you about it. It's coming straight ahead. Also, health insurance and health care, there's lots of news in this area, and there's some opportunity for you to save money. I'm going to fill you in. So even more than normal, people, tax years 2019, 2020, didn't file their returns. You think about what was going on in uh, 2020, which is when you would have filed your 19, we were in the heart of COVID. A lot of people dealing with ill family members, uh, a lot of disruption in their lives from unemployment, whatever. And COVID uh, is something we've learned to live with. But if you go back to 20 and 21, both years were highly disruptive. And so people in very large numbers, didn't file, and now have been subject to very large failure to file penalties. Well, the IRS has established a forgiveness period where you don't have to pay the failure to file penalties as long as you go ahead and get in that 2019 and or 2020 return by September 30th. So the clock's ticking. You don't have much time. But if you do this, you avoid the penalties that have been accruing. You still owe interest on failure to pay, but that's a much, much, much smaller amount than failure to file. So this is a great opportunity to clear your record with the IRS. So let's take a different situation. Let's say you did file late and you paid failure to file penalties, failing to file on time, and you paid those when you did your returns for 19 or 20. The IRS automatically says that automatically they're going to refund that money back to you. That you already paid it, they're going to send it back to you. We'll see how that works in real life. But in whatever case, you will be eligible for the return of the money. So if you didn't get around to it, you thought, ah, well, they haven't found me yet. I'm just going to ignore them. Don't do that. Go ahead and get these returns done and save yourself some money. And, you know, the, these kind of forgiveness programs have been very common in states with various state taxes, could be income or other things. But this is unusual for the feds. So don't let the opportunity pass you by. And Krista, you got some questions for me. I do. On your fancy tablet here. Yes. I like the new case you got. Thank you. Tried to go with the green theme. It's a mint green though. It's not really a So, you know, green. I'm partially colorblind. I thought that was white. Oh. Okay, well, it's green like money. It's not really money green, but that's okay. This is from Karen in Wisconsin. My question is regarding I-bonds. My husband and I have both purchased our allowed $10,000 for 2022. We can purchase another $5,000 each of the paper version with federal tax return money. I'm not a fan of letting the government use my money for free, and I always manage my withholding so that I don't receive a refund. In this case, would it make sense for us to overpay by $10,000 so that we can purchase another $5,000 of I-bonds each? So, gosh, um, the I-bond thing is such a temporary phenomenon. The I-bonds being such a deal, earning such a high rate of interest, the rate resets every six months, and it's clear that we're going to get inflation more under control. It's going to take more pain and more time than it looked like, but this is not a long-run game. So I think that that really, in this case, would be overthinking, because doing the extra withholding, remember, whatever 
current rate for Series I bonds would be, you only get that for six months, and then it goes back to uh, probably more normal kind of earnings. So I don't think I'd go through all that to be able to buy more Series I savings bonds. However, if you have tuned us out and everybody else out talking about the Series I bonds, and you have some cash laying around, buy some now because right now you are earning over 9% on these. And obviously, a lot more than one of the big banks paying you one one hundredth of 1% or even an online bank paying you 2% on your savings. Nine's a good number. Now, remember, you only get it for the first six months and then it resets. All right, and this is from Renee in New Mexico. I've, I didn't say where to buy them. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, uh, no, you don't have to apologize. That was me. <laughs> Savingsbonds.gov. Okay, Renee in New Mexico says, I've never heard you discuss stacked versus unstacked uninsured motorist, co- motorist coverage and can't find anything about it on your website. My uninsured motorist coverage is currently $250,000 per person and $500,000 per accident. I live in a state with many uninsured motorists. Should I buy stacked or unstacked coverage? Why or why not? Okay, so Renee, first of all, you live in any of the 50 states if there's a lot of people on the roads who are uninsured. And somehow, magically, it seems you always get hit by somebody who's uninsured, right? Okay, so... This is something that's available in some states and not others because auto insurance is regulated by the states. And you definitely want to buy stack coverage. What stack coverage does is it's like a force multiplier for coverage under the uninsured, underinsured motorists. So it allows you to claim more money in the event that there's more issues you need more money for that it's a mathematical formula where they call it both vertical and horizontal. And just know that without getting into all the particulars, if you live in a state that you're offered for uninsured motorists, the option is stacked or unstacked. You always want stacked because that's a much more viable coverage that you would have. Costs you a little more, worth it. Okay. And this is from Kira in Florida. My husband and I are 29 and 30 with $75,000 in savings. We own our home and are on track to potentially pay it off late next year. Or since we have a low interest rate, 3.1%, we could use our savings to buy a rental home. I wonder if you would advise we do so since we could take advantage of some lower housing costs out of state in my home state that I know very well and thus make a great investment? Or is it best to pay off our home early to minimize the risk? I've also been told it's better to just stick more money in the stock market since these investments will perform better than our interest rate. So your 3.1 is fantastic. And there's no reason to rush to pay off an interest rate that low when the interest rate you have is well below the rate of inflation. And there's other opportunities. So you haven't talked about anything, Kira, that you're doing to save specifically for retirement? You say you have $75,000 in savings, but I don't know what that means. Is that a savings account? Uh, Where is that money? So I am the man from Roth. Actually, the late Senator William Roth of Delaware is the man from Roth. But I believe so much in the Roth IRA that having a Roth IRA would be really, really, really valuable and important for the two of you to have because you're so young, 29 and 30, you've got decades for that money to grow tax-free to be spent in retirement. Uh, The highest priority to me would be if you're not doing Roth IRAs, that the money that you're diverting towards paying off the mortgage should be going towards putting into a Roth and be, uh, you can set it up where you're putting as much as 500 a month each or a total of 6000 a year into a Roth IRA, which gives you the ability to build up a pile of money for long term. I'm uh, guessing these guys probably already do that. Well, except uh, she said, I've been told it's better just stick more in the stock market since these per- will perform better. The short term stock market is not going to necessarily perform better. We could even have more of a significant slump with the stock market coming as we try to squeeze inflation out of the economy. But long term, 
and having tax-free growth in that Roth IRA is so important. If you're not doing a Roth, go read our simple guide to investing in Roth IRAs at Clark.com. Is for buying a rental property out of state, investment property, that's not a high priority right now because the run-up that has occurred in real estate values, the math of making money from rental properties, investment properties, is much harder today buying a property than it was in the past. Now, coming up next, one of the hottest sectors of inflation in our economy, even before we ever talked about inflation, was rising health care costs. I want to talk about some non-traditional players and one traditional one making moves in healthcare and how they might affect your wallet. A lot of big players, big money people are putting their noses more and more into healthcare. Amazon has been very active trying to buy stuff up and Amazon and CVS, a traditional healthcare player, they own Aetna and they're buying more and more things and setting up these health hubs and all that. CVS and Amazon got into a big fight about Signify Health, which is this uh, healthcare service for wealthier people and you got house calls and all this kind of stuff and Amazon buying One Medical, which are premium doctor's offices. So what's going on is there's a lot of skimming of the cream that Amazon's involved in, that CVS is involved in, uh, going into higher income zip codes, only serving people who tend to have pretty fat wallet, who are likely to have very good health insurance, and really not helping they're helping those individuals, but not helping with the bigger problem of healthcare availability and affordability that we have going on in the country. I'm particularly um, obsessed with, it's an obsession, with what Walmart has been doing that started experimentally and has been growing around the country with Walmart health centers. And Walmart health centers are designed for people who don't have regular access to medical care and don't necessarily have health insurance. And what I love about what Walmart's doing with their health centers is they're just very large uh, non-emergency medical offices, usually attached to or in the same property as a Walmart store and they have electronic price lists and it's just really really clear you go in for a visit 40 bucks you go in to do a school physical for a kid 24 bucks uh, everything is clearly stated and one of the things Walmart has done that everybody else has avoided is they're providing mental health therapy, mental health services. So therapy sessions are 30 to $60. You know, I can't speak at all about the caliber or quality of the therapy that's offered, the medical care that's offered. They also offer dental. I can't talk about the quality of the dental, don't know. But what I think is significant is that Walmart is doing something different than everybody else. It's all just looking for how they can make serious money in this. And Walmart is working on the accessibility side of it. The dental thing, you know, a lot of people really, really ignore their dental health. And as any dentist will tell you in greater detail than maybe you want to hear, is how much your dental health or lack thereof can affect your physical health. And so a dental exam is 25 bucks. I mean, that's cheap. Teeth cleaning, 25 bucks. For kids, it's 15. I mean, this is really good stuff. And so they lay everything out item by item. It just depends where you are in the country if you have access to a Walmart health center. 
And is this going to solve everything with medical care? No. Not far from it. Nobody is the magician that can solve everything with health care. But we've got a lot of people in America who don't qualify for government-provided health care, which more than half of Americans get with Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or other government-type health care services. And then we have people who don't work for an employer that provides health care, and they're on their own. And they may not be able to afford the premiums that are available at healthcare.gov. And so they go without. And so having a place you can go where you know the price, and they're not going to turn their noses up at you because you're not somebody with some kind of major health insurer insurance card, is good stuff. And I wish that Amazon, with all its high-minded talk about healthcare, actually was trying to do something for people who didn't have a lot of money instead of just focusing on people who do have a lot of money. And that's it for my Amazon bash for right now, Krista. So all right. what you got for I've me? I've got a question from Michelle in Missouri. She says, what are the best places to get eyeglass frames online? Eyeglass frames, just the frames? Frames, but I think probably the whole eyeglasses. Is well, you know, we do get questions from people about just buying frames. The irony with the eyeglass business, this is a funny thing, is that often with eyeglasses is that buying the whole thing from a discounter, even if you end up ditching the lenses, is cheaper than just buying frames normally, which is weird. But we have done uh, our own write-up at Clark.com on the best places to get eyeglasses uh, and this is looking at the quality, looking at the price. And Consumer Reports has done this as well. Ours, a little different than Consumer Reports ratings, but in some ways similar. We have Costco is the best place in America. Shock, right? Costco, the best place in America to get uh, frames, lenses complete because of the customer service and quality you get. But both we and Consumer Reports really, really, really like Zenny. Zenny is by far the cheapest out there, uh, does have some customer service issues, but not terrible. And the glasses are ridiculously cheap. And you're looking at being able to buy a pair of prescription glasses, frames, lenses complete for effectively $15, including shipping, is what it'll typically work out to. That's the whole thing. People spend more than that on their sunglasses. What do you spend on your sunglasses? Chris? I buy cheap sunglasses. I always get them from like Marshalls because I lose them. So I spend like $10. So you're spending $10. like $10? Yeah. I know you think that's a lot because you like Yeah, because if you go tree. to $1.25 tree... You pay a dollar twenty-five for a pair of sunglasses because you can lose the dollar twenty-five pair of sunglasses the same as you can lose your ten dollar. Well, pair ten of ten isn't a lot compared to what a lot of people. Pay That's for true. Sunglasses. That's true. But think about with Zenny, you're getting a prescription pair of glasses in that same general price range. Um, a lot of people love Warby Parker, and particularly the thing you asked about the frames. There are a lot of people who go to Warby Parker just because they have such a great variety of frames. Warby Parker, I said, go to both in online and now with physical stores in so many locations. So if you think about those three, you're going to find a really good selection and really good prices from Costco, Zenny, and Warby Parker. You could do... Much worse than just limiting your search to one of those three. That's where I'd look. I do have a suggestion. If it is just frames, um, what you can do is you can buy reader like reading glasses. Um, and if you, I know you want to do online. I'm sure you can get those all over the web. They're so much cheaper, and then you could flip out the lenses. Um, I've found a lot of reading glasses at like. Marshalls again, TJ Maxx. I'm kind of big on those stores. I love them. That are very cool, and you could you could swap out the lenses. I know people who do that. They take their reading glasses and. And what we don't know in this case 
is if we're more interested in designer frames at a right. discount or not. So you got to know the thing with the designer frames. A lot of the designer frames are part of a European-based cartel. The brands are owned by, and they really have a hammer lock on the prices. So what I recommend is there's a brand name frame that you're really into. Look for one that is similar that is not controlled by the European cartel, and you can cut the price of the frames by 95% or more. And from Kim in Kentucky, I want to share my cell phone savings by using your advice in hopes it may help others. First, we've been AT&T cell phone customers since 2004. Just by calling and asking if there was a more economical plan, we were upgraded to their starter unlimited tox text data plan and saved $32 per month on our family plan. There are cheaper options, but while we research our next move, we can save some money. Our next move is probably switching to Mint Mobile. We got one phone from my teenager from Mint to see how the service is in our location. So smart. So far, it is working very well. I ultimately think all of our phones will switch, which would lead to $110 per month savings. So think about that. All right. So for the family saving right now, we're talking about $1,300 and something per year by switching. $1,320. If Mint Mobile continues to be reliable versus being with one of the big three in this situation, AT&T. There is such an advantage with cell phone service to shopping around within your own company that you're with now, but even the bigger savings are when you're willing to go further afield, the savings you can get are gigantic. And Philip in North Carolina says, years ago, while subjecting my children to Clark, as mine and all good parents should do, they asked me to invest half of their allowance in stocks. I had heard you mention the Schwab Total Market Index Fund, so I set up a brokerage account for each and and then initiated automatic investments of $10 a month. Now there's $480 in each account. Is that still the best place for the money in future investments? I think it could be used for a down payment on a future house, but probably not retirement. The primary goal for me is conversations about money investments, returns, and delayed gratification. Thus, it must remain invested in stocks in some form. Up and downs don't scare us. They just add to the conversation. Okay, so I love this. First of all, it is cruel for you to make your children <laughs> listen to me. They actually listen, though. They wanted to invest in stocks. Well, I think that was parental influence. But anyway, the uh, Schwab Total Market Index, great choice, wonderful place to stash cash and build the savings and investment habit and over time that money will grow and grow and grow the only potential harm to this is if any of your children are intending to go to college that it does harm their qualification for financial aid money that's in their own name when your kids start working as teens you would want to pivot this to putting money into a Roth IRA Uh, again, the man from Roth, you put the money into the Roth IRA, it won't hurt them on college financial aid applications, and the money grows tax-free and ultimately not used specifically for the purposes you name for the kids. It's way down the road, but it starts their nest egg for saving long-term for retirement, and again, tax-free. So I hope you've heard something today that's been useful in your life. And if there's something that you haven't heard me talk about that you're like, how do you do this? What's the answer to this? I got this problem, whatever. We have free one-on-one advice. We've been doing so for just a whisker less than 30 years where you can get free one-on-one advice from one of our wonderful volunteers or paid staff members from our Team Clark Consumer Action Center, and we are here to serve you 30 hours each week. You can learn all the details if you go to clark.com CAC. Have a great day.